Hello and welcome to Illinois Lawmakers Live coverage of Governor Bruce Launer's initial State of the State speech on Illinois Public Television and Radio. I'm Jack Titchener, joined here in the Speaker's Gallery by Illinois Public Radio State House correspondent Amanda Vinicky and Rich Miller, the editor and publisher of the Capital Facts newsletter. Congratulations, by the way, to the both of you for being named among the top State House reporters in the country. I'm in, I'm in good company here. Uh, the introductions are going on right now as Speaker Madigan is welcoming the dignitaries who are assembled in the House along with the, all the members of the House and the Senate who are here for this speech. We've been hearing over uh, the last few weeks uh, some bits and pieces about uh, what Governor Rauner is supposed to say today. Yes, we have. And the really big takeaway on that, some of it is from the campaign trail, workers' compensation, unemployment insurance. But really, it has been a message to unions, watch out. He wants some big changes there that would perhaps allow them to do less collective bargaining. He has released that in speeches and also in a series of slides, a memo he sent to members of the General Assembly. So we're expecting to hear more about that today. He's been doing kind of a sales presentation to a lot of people around the state, Rich. He's been talking about the problems for two years, right? And specifically, uh, actually, since the election, he's kind of amped it up a bit. What I think people are looking for today is some solutions. It's like, okay, you've defined the problems, now give us some solutions. Um, I think they're hungry for it after two years of campaigning to finally produce something viable about how he wants to take the state forward. And he has a situation facing him that no one would really envy uh, because with the expiration of the state income tax at the end of uh, December, that blew a $2 billion hole in a budget that already has, is already $7 billion in the hole as it is. Exactly, and so that is where a lot of the problems that he's talked about have been focused thus far. I'm not personally anticipating that we're going to get a lot of those sort of answers in this speech. He gives a budget address February 18th, and this will be more platform form sort of areas, perhaps drilling into, as Rich said, these solutions to the problems that he's talked about with the faults that unions, he says, have caused the budget situation and Illinois driving out business to other states. We're having, uh, we're having some uh, disruption here in the uh, chambers, uh, but uh, things have calmed down a little bit. Governor Rauner is being announced to come into the House chambers for the speech. Everyone standing for that. Amanda, as you said, we don't expect a lot of detail today on what the potential solutions are, but Rich, a lot of people are wanting those nonetheless. You know, Jack, I didn't hear what you said. <laughs> Too much clapping. A, a rousing round of applause as Governor Rauner makes his uh, way into the House chambers uh, for his first trip as governor. Uh, not a lot of detail expected today, but a lot of people would like to hear it today. Yes, they would. Uh, again, after two years, they would like to hear some details. The Tribune reported this morning that he will offer up some details, like, for instance, hiring more prison guards. There's a huge amount of money the state is spending on overtime for prison guards because they simply don't have enough prison guards uh, to guard these prisons. prisoners. The problem with that, of course, is it where do you find money. the money? <laughs> Hooray! Yeah, I think we will hear perhaps some details in terms of what he wants to do. Perhaps we will again get a layout, I'm sure, of the, the lay of the land, how he views the state of Illinois, and then some of his solutions for it, but not the details in terms of how to make that happen, how to pay for it. And, and it's his first opportunity, really, to speak to lawmakers as a group, he's done some individual sessions with many of the lawmakers in the weeks leading up to this. Yes, he's actually done a really good job of sitting down individually with legislators, going to their reception, having several of them together, one-on-one, -on -one, phone calls, meetings in their offices, where have you. He's done a much better job at that than any of his predecessors in memory. And uh, Governor Rauner now getting ready to shake hands with Speaker Madigan and Senate President John Cullerton and ready to begin his initial State of the State speech to the people of Illinois. Mr. Governor, please proceed. Good afternoon. President Cullerton, Speaker Madigan, Leader Redonio, Leader Durkin, Lieutenant Governor Sanguinetti, Attorney General Madigan, Secretary White, Comptroller Munger, Treasurer Freyricks, members of the General Assembly, thank you all for your service. To our distinguished guests and to members of the media, 
Thank you for attending today. It's an honor to stand before you. Today marks a new beginning for Illinois and a new partnership between the General Assembly and the Governor. Last November, voters made it clear they want bipartisan government. They want a government where people come together to solve problems and get things done. They don't want partisan bickering, political infighting, or personal conflict to get in the way of serving the needs of the families of Illinois. All of us who are elected to do a job, to deliver real results, to serve the people of Illinois to the best of our ability. Uh, thank you. All of us have a duty to serve all the people of Illinois, those who voted for us, as well as those who did not vote for us. The good Lord didn't make us Republicans or Democrats. He made us in his image to do his work, to help each other, to make the world a better place. We all have a moral duty to serve the long-term interests of the people of Illinois, to focus on the next generation, not the next election. I am personally committed to working closely with you each and every one of you, meeting together, solving problems together, listening and learning from each other. Together, we will do great things for the people of Illinois. We will once again make Illinois the greatest state in the greatest nation on earth. The task ahead of us is daunting. We have no time to waste. At the beginning of today's session, you, each of you should have received a copy of our policy agenda. It is bold, aggressive, and comprehensive. It is both very necessary and very doable. In our agenda, each of you will probably see some things you don't like but each of you will certainly see many things that you like a lot. We should consider it as a whole, not as a list of individual initiatives. We must choose to see the big picture, an overall package that will lift up all of the people we've been chosen to represent. With that as our common goal, there is no doubt that we can, together, as partners, get big things done. Let us commit to doing the people's work. Over the past dozen years, 275,000 more people decided to leave Illinois than chose to come here. That's like the cities of Springfield, Decatur, and Champaign all completely disappearing. And over that same time period, the states around us have been kicking our tails. The worst performing of our neighboring states has had six and a half times the job growth per thousand people as Illinois has had. Iowa's had more than 15 times the job growth that we've had. Last summer, I met the Grip family, Michael, Andrea, and their children of some of the luckier ones. Michael lives in Illinois, and he wants to stay here. But after getting laid off, he couldn't find a job near home. Now he must commute one hour and 20 minutes to his office in Williamsburg, Iowa. The Grip's loyalty and family roots have kept them in Illinois, but they wonder how much longer they can last and whether their children can find good careers here. And there are families like the Grip's in every community in Illinois. It's time to give them hope. It's time to give them the opportunity to stay. Our top priority must be making Illinois competitive again, to grow more jobs here. To become more competitive, we must look to the structural impediments to our economic growth. 
our workers' compensation, unemployment insurance, and liability costs all rank among the worst in America. Those costs add up to far more than just numbers on an accountant's balance sheet. They impact real people with real jobs and real families. Onesimo Gutierrez is in the gallery today. For 18 years, Onesimo has worked at the Sealy Mattress Factory in Batavia. Recently, he got a letter saying their plant is being moved to Indiana. And the plant in Illinois is expected to close this spring. It is heartbreaking that what is happening to Onesimo is happening to countless others throughout our state. Two and a half years ago, Modern Forge Company, a 100-year-old family-owned manufacturing business, began moving its operations to Indiana from Blue Island, Illinois. Modern Forge employs 230 people. In Illinois, it paid between $700,000 and $1.5 million a year in workers' comp premiums. In Indiana, the same premium is $250,000. Modern Forge is competing with manufacturers across the country that don't have Illinois' costs. Modern Forge needed to move to stay competitive. Since then, they've hired 100 new Indiana workers. And today, almost half of its workforce lives in Indiana. Leaders in both political parties, including Attorney General Madigan, have advocated for much-needed reforms that address the shortcomings of the workers' compensation law that was passed in 2011. Working together, we can create a common-sense system that protects, fair, protects and fairly compensates those who are injured on the job, while also assuring that both public and private employers are not overburdened by an irrational system. Too many people in our communities must overcome not only hurdles that state government has put in place, but also decades of hidden barriers that have caused their communities to suffer. Approximately 80% of individuals in Illinois apprenticeship programs are white, even though Caucasians make up fewer than 63% of our population. Whatever the reason for this disparity, it has gone on for too long. And we must take specific, positive action to end this unfair situation. We should require unions that contract with the state to have their apprenticeship programs reflect the demographics of Illinois communities. And to have their membership on public construction projects reflect the diversity in the surrounding area. And we should create a minority enterprise small business investment program to assist minority entrepreneurs in startups throughout Illinois. We must also help those workers who are barely getting by, by raising the minimum wage. Our economic growth and jobs package increases the minimum wage to $10 an hour over the next seven years. Raising the minimum wage in conjunction with improving the overall jobs climate will make Illinois more competitive and create a boom in economy while increasing incomes for hardworking Illinoisans.
As we look to make Illinois more competitive, property tax relief is one of our most pressing challenges. Our property tax burden is one of the biggest impediments to growth, and it hurts both businesses and middle-class families. The average homeowner in Illinois pays more than three times the amount of property taxes as a homeowner in Indiana. More than an additional $3,000 paid out of the family's budget every single year. Take, for instance, Christine Dalgapol. Christine is in the gallery here with us today. She bought her home in 1978. At the time, her taxes were $1,100. By 2013, her taxes were $4,797. Even after accounting for inflation, Christine's taxes have almost doubled. Even after getting a senior exemption and almost yearly appeals. And she's not alone. Over the past decade, the average property tax bill has increased nearly 33 percent. Meanwhile, real family incomes in Illinois have gone down. Families have been left with less income and more taxes. Our property taxes are out of control and are crushing middle class families. Illinois' high property taxes have skyrocketed because state and local governments have been unable or unwilling to control their own spending. We must empower taxpayers to take control of their property tax bills by giving them greater ability to control local government spending. The time has come to give the people of Illinois the ability to drive value for their tax dollars. Our agenda must be about empowerment, about empowering the people of Illinois to control their futures. Empowerment means giving local voters the ability to control the collective bargaining issues in their local governments and take more responsibility for their employees' benefits. Empowerment means giving local government employees the ability to decide for themselves whether they want to join a union. Empowerment means... <laughs> Empowerment means giving governments the ability to lower costs by reforming project labor agreements and prevailing wage requirements that block true competitive bidding. These requirements can increase the cost of taxpayer-funded construction projects by 20 percent or more. At the Illinois Tollway, uncompetitive bidding has cost toll payers over a billion dollars since 2005. At the Department of Transportation, uncompetitive bidding costs taxpayers more than $100 million per year. Reforming the prevailing wage laws could save our schools nearly $160 million every year. We must restructure the bidding for construction projects at every level of government because reforms will save taxpayers billions and we can reinvest those billions in even more capital projects to help our schools and our communities. Empowerment means giving taxpayers the ability to consolidate local governments to control costs. Illinois has the most governments in the country, nearly 7,000 local units, and the taxpayers of Illinois can no longer afford all of them. DuPage County Executive Dan Cronin is with us today in the gallery. He has already achieved significant government consolidation. To date, his reforms 
have generated a projected $100 million in taxpayer savings through joint purchasing, shared services, employee benefit reforms, and modifications to procurement practices. Congratulations, Dan. You're a role model for all of us. <laughs> Empowerment means freeing local governments from unfunded mandates imposed by the state. We impose more than 280 unfunded mandates that cost local communities billions. In the days ahead, I will be asking Lieutenant Governor Evelyn Sanguinetti to work with leaders like Dan Cronin on consolidation efforts, as well as ways to reduce costs imposed on local governments. We must also empower voters to decide for themselves whether they want their communities to become employee empowerment zones. These zones will give employees the freedom to choose whether or not they want to join a union. Local communities, local voters, deserve this option so that they can compete with other states and other nations for new businesses and new investment. <laughs> Employee empowerment zones will increase jobs for residents, increase economic activity for local businesses, and generate more tax dollars for local governments. It's a win-win-win proposal. By implementing these reforms, we will give taxpayers and local governments the tools they need to freeze property taxes. It will allow us to begin reforming our out-of-date tax code. We have an antiquated tax system whose base is too narrow, and that makes us uncompetitive. Let's work together to enact competitive 21st century tax system for a 21st century economy. The best voter empowerment tool is term limits. Term limits overcome the power of incumbency and help bring fresh thinking to government. Let's finally give the people a chance to enact term limits by putting that constitutional amendment on the 2016 ballot and let the voters decide. At the start of this session, you received a summary of certain past conflicts of interest in Illinois state government. We must eliminate this sort of political dealing. Government unions should not be allowed to influence the public officials they are lobbying and sitting across the bargaining table from through campaign donations and expenditures. That, that has been federal law since 1947. Government must never force its employees to fund activities they do not support. President Jimmy Carter prohibited that at the federal level in 1978. While we currently ban contributions from many businesses with state contracts, some of the largest recipients of taxpayer money like hospitals that receive millions from Medicaid, are still able to funnel huge campaign donations to elected officials. Let's close the special interest loopholes by extending the prohibition on political contributions for businesses with state contracts to all organizations with a state collective bargaining agreement and organizations funded by entities receiving state Medicaid funds. In time, we should also take another step towards trustworthy government by prohibiting trial lawyer donations to elected judges. We should move toward merit-based judicial reform 
as supported by the American Bar Association. We will leave no stone unturned as we look to bring good government, good management practices here to Springfield. Over the past year, there has been discussion about reforming the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library and Museum to ensure the museum and library are the world-class institutions they deserve to be. Our administration is working in partnership with Speaker Madigan on a reorganization plan. And we look to have a resolution during this spring session. And we've already spoken about the need to merge the Comptroller's Office with the Treasurer's Office. Doing so would save taxpayers $12 million per year and would be a fitting tribute to Judy Barr Topinka's legacy. Let's make Judy's amendment a reality. Our state employees deserve fair, competitive wages. It's time to revamp how compensation works in state government. Let's emphasize quality of work instead of simply longevity of work. Let's pay great state employees more for their excellent performance. And those who find innovative ways to save taxpayers money deserve to earn bonuses. As we look for further government reform and to bring best management practices to our state, our criminal justice system is one area we must focus on. We have to both prevent crime from occurring and reform the parole system and the reentry process so that the same people are not returning to prison over and over. The conditions in our prisons are unacceptable. Inmates and corrections officers alike find themselves in an unsafe environment. It's wrong. We will hire more correctional officers to improve safety in our prisons. We will also continue to invest in adult redeploy. Since its implementation in 2011, adult redeploy has diverted more than 1,900 offenders into community-based programming. Congratulations to all of you in the legislature who supported adult redeploy. Let's continue to build on these corrections reforms. Now let's talk about the most important thing we do together as a community, education. I promise to increase education funding, and I will keep that promise. We will increase K-12 education support. This, this increased support will particularly help our most disadvantaged school districts. And our budget will increase funding for early childhood education. So that, so that more at-risk children can enter kindergarten ready to succeed. From cradle to career, our children's education needs to be our top priority. That means we must also invest in technical and vocational training. We used to emphasize these programs in our high schools and community colleges, but those efforts have been fading. Let's end the era of cutting funding for technical training and community colleges. Every child deserves access to excellent schools. But that's not what every child's getting in Illinois. Too many students are trapped in failing schools or schools that are not a good fit for them. We can give them better. We must give them better. 
Lucy Reese is with us today in the gallery. Wave, Lucy. There she is. She lives in the Roseland neighborhood in Chicago and sends her children to public charter schools. She made that decision because they offer longer school days, enhanced learning opportunities, and variety for her kids. Her youngest daughter has struggled in English and language arts. She currently attends Ralph Ellison Chicago Charter School, which makes sure she gets more attention in these subjects. On the other hand, her son is a junior at Gary Comer College Prep. That high school offers much more rigorous and disciplined curriculum, perfect for his accelerated learning style. It's time we give every child in, and parent in Illinois the same choices Lucy has been able to make for her children. Our student and career success package will lift the cap on public charter schools and give parents and students more options. <laughs> Next to being a parent, teaching is the most important job in the world. We must support our many good teachers. That means putting more resources directly into classrooms, reforming the education bureaucracy, and rolling back costly mandates. Our education bureaucracy stands between state resources and the classroom. We must find ways to reduce it. Our students and teachers today are overwhelmed by too many tests. We must ensure that the amount of time we test our students doesn't get in the way of high quality instruction. <laughs> Much of the reform agenda we're outlining today has been implemented in other states. The reforms are working so well in those states that they are causing us to become even less competitive. We must avoid slipping further behind other states in the quality of our children's education, the capacity of our economy to grow, and our ability to care for our state's most vulnerable. It's now or never for Illinois. It's time to act. All of us in this chamber were elected to deliver results, make choices, and cast votes that are in the best interest of the people of Illinois. Choices about what's best for the next generation, not the next election. The time is now for all of us, Republicans and Democrats, to do big things, the right things, for the people of our great state. Now is the time for bold and decisive action. It is make or break time for the land of Lincoln. We can reclaim our proud history as a strong and vibrant state and fulfill our destiny as a beacon of the Midwest. Illinois has a history of accomplishing big things. Yesterday, we marked the 150th anniversary of the 13th Amendment to the Constitution, which ended slavery. Illinois was the first state in the nation to ratify that amendment put forward by our greatest statesman, Abraham Lincoln. When we believe in something, when we work together, we can change the course of history. The year 2018 will mark Illinois' 200th birthday. In the countdown to our bicentennial, let's come together, governor and legislators, to make the tough decisions that everyone from Chicago to Cairo, Rockford to Carbondale, knows we must make. This is our last best chance to get our house in order, to restore good government. Let's approach our 200th year as the great state of Illinois, as a proud people, standing tall, with eyes focused on the future. Competitiveness must become our watchword, 
and opportunity and compassion our goals so that we can once again become the place people want to come to build a better life for themselves and their families. Today marks a new beginning. I'm excited and honored to work closely with you. Together, we will get great things done for the people of Illinois. Thank you, and God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. Illinois Governor Bruce Rauner delivering his first State of the State speech to a joint session of the Illinois General Assembly. Good afternoon, I'm Jack Kitchener, along with Amanda Vinicky of Illinois Public Radio and Rich Miller from the Capital Facts Newsletter. Uh, it is, uh, I think it's fair to say uh, that uh, this was basically uh, fleshing out a lot of those familiar themes that he's touched upon over the years. A couple of surprises along the way, like raising the minimum wage over uh, a seven-year period yeah. to $10 an hour. Well, that's, I, you know, I haven't heard a governor get laughed at like that in it quite a while. It was remarkable. They literally clapped. He said, I want to increase the minimum wage. And there was, I think, some stunned clapping. Right. And then over the next seven years, the second half of that sentence literally got laughs. And it wasn't meant to be a joke. No, no. But it was, it was, it was kind of a surprise nonetheless because he's always kind of been against that. Uh, in terms of the uh, uh, attack on the labor unions, all of that was there. He uh, talked a lot about the outgrowth of jobs because of uh, the, the situation the state has found uh, itself in. He wants workers' compensation reform. He wants unemployment insurance reform. Your takeaway from everything today? There was a lot of what we had heard from him before, really, in terms of this union message. What was really most striking to me, Jack, was the reaction he got to it from the General Assembly. This is a joint session, so the House and Senate. It is really a visual demonstration of how many more Democrats there are than Republicans. They spill over across the aisle, have to share some seats, seats that are brought in to fit all the Democrats. And so many of them just sat so cold through this entire speech, refusing to clap. I was watching. One of them didn't even stand at the end when she was done. She was, I don't know, texting or doing something and then eventually got up. It did not go over well. They were expecting that sort of message. He gave it, and they did not like it. But I think that even on the Democratic side of the aisle, there's a lot of recognition, particularly if you have a district that borders Indiana or, or another state like that, that some things in workers' comp, unemployment insurance, need to be addressed. And I think that uh, much of this union stuff, he's kind of taken a hard line at the beginning in order to bring back. a hard line to the table and then eventually bring them closer to him and he'll move closer to them. You notice I, I think something actually will be done on this in a year or two. You notice that he did bring up the fact that he's uh, that there has been some uh, uh, interest in uh, workers' compensation reform from the Democratic Attorney General, Lisa Correct. Madigan. Um, she has uh, uh, an infamous example of an employee who was at a candy machine and the candy bar or whatever, the snack didn't come out, and he threw himself at the candy machine, injured himself, and then got workers' compensation. What about these Which is, what the heck, right? What, what about these local empowerment zones where uh, you'd be able, a community could, could opt out of prevailing wage agreements, union required union memberships and the like? Uh, dead. Yeah, there's no way that that's going to go. I do think that there are some who say that they don't need the General Assembly's approval, that you, there is no law forbidding it right now, and therefore maybe Rauner will use his sums of money there in his campaign account to try and get that to go forward and select municipalities, but overall that is dead. I think Rich is right. There's room for compromise. Um, but that said, he had made all of these efforts toward meeting the individual legislators, trying to develop relationships. And you could see, and again, literally here by the lack of clapping, how that has gone over at this point. Perhaps he's stepping overboard almost early in hopes of finding a compromise later. He did get some, he did get some applause from the Democratic side of the mm -hmm. aisle when he talked about more money for education, K-12 through education. Of course, his wife has been very active in early childhood education issues for many years in the state. Yeah, it's uh, becoming apparent that Mrs. Rauner is having an impact on this administration. And he actually admitted it last year that 
uh, during the campaign, that she would uh, influence him on uh, things, and she's weighed in with him. We and know he's that always said fact. that education is a top priority Correct. for him. He has served on charter school boards. He did not say anything about charter schools or really the changes that he wants in education beyond giving more money. Who would be opposed to that? The question, of course, is how is he going to pay for it? And he says the answer seems to be so far in these broad reforms and a total retooling of the tax code. But we didn't get any more detail beyond right. that. And you have to remember, just a year ago in this chamber, overwhelming support for a ban on new charter schools. So We're going to have to wrap you up right there. Now. Thanks very much to Amanda Vinicky and uh, Rich Miller. This is live coverage of Governor Bruce Rauner's State of the State speech on Illinois Public Television and Radio. Speaker Madigan is right behind you. I am personally committed to working closely with you, each and every one of you, meeting together, solving problems together, listening and learning from each other. Together, we will do great things for the people of Illinois. We will once again make Illinois the greatest state in the greatest nation on earth. The task ahead of us is daunting. We have no time to waste. At the beginning of today's session, you, each of you should have received a copy of our policy agenda. It is bold, aggressive, and comprehensive. It is both very necessary and very doable. In our agenda, each of you will probably see some things you don't like. Joining us now on Illinois Lawmakers, the Speaker okay. of the Illinois House of Representatives, the Honorable Michael J. Madigan, Democrat of Chicago. I'm, I hate to sound like I'm yelling at you, but I may have to to speak over the, uh, the uh, noise here. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the governor said that uh, uh, there's going to be an end to bipartisan bickering. There's going to be a lot of cooperation across the aisles. Your take on the speech. I thought the governor did a very good job of setting out his agenda for Illinois. We in the legislature are most anxious to receive that agenda, take it under consideration, assign it to committees, give it full consideration. I'm very encouraged by the governor's embracing of my idea to restructure the governance for the Abraham Lincoln Library here in Springfield. Today, the Abraham Lincoln Library and Museum is under the governance of a three-headed monster, which has really impeded the uh, intelligent decision-making at the library. So I'm happy that he's... So there is, some, my there, there is some working there together. He also indicated that uh, the Attorney General, Lisa Madigan, your daughter, has indicated an interest in working, develop, working together to do more for uh, workers' compensation reform. Your thoughts? Well, she's already issued a memorandum which indicates that there should be changes in workers' compensation in the area of what's called causation, which is a significant issue. It's a publicly available document. Uh, generally speaking, labor unions are opposed to her position. A lot of labor, excuse me, a lot of industry and business leaders tell me privately it hasn't been so much the tax rates in Illinois that have stifled business, it's workers' comp and unemployment and insurance. Well, this, this is an issue that we've been called upon to deal with in the past before the legislature. As late as 2011, we made significant changes in the workers' compensation statute, and we saved considerable money for the employers of the state in that 2011 legislation. But we're prepared to uh, go back on the issue, consider the governor's ideas, and see if we can show some progress. As the governor has outlined in recent weeks, he has uh, a lot of interest in reforming the way that organized labor has traditionally worked in the state of Illinois. Organized labor traditionally a very strong supporter of the Democratic Party. Is this going to go anywhere in this chamber or in the Senate? Well, I think what we ought to do is to understand that organized labor represents working people. For myself, I'm very interested in helping working people. And I'm sure that almost every member of the legislature shares that view. Uh, organized labor doesn't represent everybody, but they do advance significant ideas before the legislature as to how we can improve the economy, 
help people get jobs, keep jobs, pay taxes, make a mortgage payment, pay for the education of a child. One of the things, of course, we didn't hear today is how he's going to pay for more money for K through 12 schools for early education. We expect to know more about that two weeks from today. Well, I think that the uh, number one issue before the legislature today would be the budget deficits. The current budget deficit and the next two. But the one that we ought to focus on is the deficit in the current budget. There's about five months left in the budget and we ought to focus on the uh, deficit in the current budget. Uh, at this point, uh, it's been reported today that uh, the governor's office approached you and uh, your Senate counterpart, President Cullerton, uh, asking for emergency powers to rearrange the budget, to plug the holes in the budget. I think they're being responsive to my suggestion that we ought to focus on the deficit in the current budget. They've advanced certain ideas. We're interested in working through those ideas, but everybody should come together today focus on the deficit in the current budget and take action to cure that deficit. One of the problems you're having right now, of course, is early childhood, early childhood funding or daycare funding has been exhausted and we still have several months to go in the fiscal year. Well, I think it's growth of state spending, but today they're asking for an increase in appropriation for child care and for the Department of Corrections. I'm not being critical, but this just explains how difficult it is to manage state government when there's a shortage of resources. Is there, at the end of the day, a middle ground or a path that can be navigated to come up with a budget that meets the needs of the state of Illinois uh, based on the priorities both parties have? Uh, it would be my goal to be intimately involved in brokering that compromise. You may remember at the beginning of the Royovich administration, I may have been the only Democrat in Illinois that was preaching fiscal austerity. Uh, Goyevich didn't agree with me. I was generally criticized by the media for opposing the governor. But 12 years ago, I was preaching fiscal austerity, and I think that that's what we ought to do. At this point, some of the other ideas on the table, uh, he mentioned the idea of consolidating the 7,000 units of local government around the state. Good idea. Well, Dan Cronin has been very successful in DuPage County. We ought to work on his model and see if we can't do more of that statewide. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as term limits on the, uh, on the 2016 ballot? Yeah, uh, I live with term limits, and I think that term limits are good when they're administered by the voters of the state. So in my case, I stood for election five times in the last 11 months. I stood for election as a state representative in the March primary, I stood for election to a membership on the Democratic State Central Committee in the March primary. In April, I was re-elected as the chairman of the Democratic Party. In November, I was re-elected as a state representative. In January, I was re-elected as the speaker. So the voters had plenty of opportunities over the last 11 months to retire me from state government. Term limits are good when administered by the voters. Mr. Speaker, thanks very much for your time. We it's appreciate great to be it. Here. Always good to have you on the program. Thank you. Up next on Illinois Lawmakers, we'll hear from the two Republican leaders in the Illinois House and Senate. And over that same time period, the states around us have been kicking our tails. The worst performing of our neighboring states has had six and a half times the job growth per thousand people as Illinois has had. Iowa's had more than 15 times the job growth that we've had. Last summer, I met the Grip family, Michael, Andrea, and their children of some of the luckier ones. Michael lives in Illinois, and he wants to stay here. But after getting laid off, he couldn't find a job near home. Now he must commute one hour and 20 minutes to his office in Williamsburg, Iowa. The Grip's loyalty and family roots have kept them in Illinois, but they wonder how much longer they can last and whether their children can find good careers here. And there are families like the Grip's in every community in Illinois. It's time to give them hope. It's time to give them the opportunity to stay. Our top priority must be making Illinois competitive again, to grow more jobs here, 
To become more competitive, we must look to the structural impediments to our economic growth. For the first time in 12 years, uh, you've heard one of your own here giving the state of the state speech. We're talking now to uh, Democratic, excuse me, Republican leader of the House of Representatives, Jim Durkin of Western Springs, and the Senate Republican leader, Christine Rodonio of uh, Lamont. Good to have you both here. Your response to... Uh, I had to pinch myself that I had a Republican addressing us on the state of the state address, so it's been uh, long overdue. It's uh, very welcome. It was a long, tough campaign. Uh, but. Governor Rauner has laid out the diagnosis of the problems and the ills within state government. And he's doing it in a very aggressive, bold manner, as he promised. So uh, what we heard today, we look at it in its totality. It's about putting Illinois, Illinoisans back to work, reducing our unemployment, paying our bills, the things that we've been talking about for decades. And I think that he's going to get there. Leader Rodonia. Well, it was refreshing. I think there was a lot of anticipation about today's speech. I think that we need to be focused, as he pointed out, on the bottom line. Illinois is not competitive. People are leaving the state. And whatever tough medicine we need to take in order to get back on a competitive track and provide families with an opportunity to earn a living, we need to do. At this point, though, a lot of these ideas kind of sailed over the transom into the, the Democratic side of the House here where your colleagues were sitting from the House and Senate and uh, met by very quiet, uh, uh, a quiet response. The, the fact of the matter is they hold super majorities here. How do you advance some of these ideas that Governor Rauner is espousing, and I know that you both support, how do you get buy-in from that side of the aisle? Well, one, they're not used to Republicans uh, standing there and giving this type of speech, but remember where Governor Rauner came from. He came from a world where he was highly successful in crafting the deal, working with people to find the right, uh, you know, the, the right place, the right time, and the right concepts and putting together to, and he's going to take that same approach. He's doing an excellent job of reaching out to the legislators on an individual basis. And I will say the personal touch that a governor has with a sitting member of the House and the Senate goes a long way. And he's doing a very good job with that right now. I would say remember too that the constituencies that the Democrats represent are suffering as well. They need jobs, they need to get this state back on track as well. So we do have a common interest in solving this. Speaker Madigan, when he was here just a few minutes ago, acknowledged that there could be more work done in one of the key areas you're concerned about, and that's workers' compensation reform. Well, it's refreshing that uh, the Speaker has stated that he's open to uh, making the changes that our business community has been asking for for a number of years. Uh, Senator Redonio has been talking about causation being a very important uh, issue that needs to be put on the table, and I think that that is extremely important. Both of us have talked to Doug Oberhelman with Caterpillar, and the cost of work, work comp insurance for him is overwhelming and that's why they are not making new investments in Illinois. That is one of our, it's our greatest and our strongest employer. So uh, it's very refreshing that the speaker is open to finding a solution to the, the problems we have in our work comp system. What about the, the ongoing problems that we have? He talked about hiring more correctional officers for Illinois prisons, a rollover for them to, to kind of take down the head count. Where's he going to find the money to do this? Much, much less try to uh, uh, provide more money for K through edu K through 12 education. Well, I think we're talking about managing the state's resources. Remember, the problem we've had for the last 13 years is spending more money than we have coming in the door. He's very innovative and willing to look at ways, as you point out, not only hiring more officers but reducing the prison population. Um, there's some attractive elements for everyone in that package, and we have to remember to think of this as a package. There's a little something for everyone. He started with that. There's going to be some things we don't like, but we need to come together to make ourselves competitive. One of the things that a lot of the folks on the Democratic side of the aisle set quietly on was a lot of the ideas he had uh, in terms of uh, how to address the state's uh, uh, organized labor unions. A lot of them uh, deal with uh, state employees, the state prisons, uh, you name it, around the state. That, that kind of fell on the floor over here, kind of thud. Well, it's a discussion we need to have. I mean, again, we go back to the fact that other states are doing things differently and succeeding. And because we've had one party control for so long, we haven't even had an opportunity to discuss how we are moving forward relative to other states. Again, this is a, a, a speech which Democrats have never heard. Many of them never heard from the Republican governor, but everything's on the table. And I think it's going to force organized labor to engage with the second floor of the governor's office 
on how they move forward with their labor contracts, but also how we structure business and uh, our infrastructure programs in Illinois. Can the state of Illinois really do anything about my property taxes down in Jackson County? Well, we can freeze them. I mean, that's an option. Obviously, that has consequences locally. But again, when you talk about the package deal approach, um, he's also talking about consolidating local governments. I mean, there's an opportunity here to encourage um, consolidations and forcing locals to do things more and your, efficiently. And your as well. former your former Senate colleague uh, Dan, Dan Cronin, Cronin has done right. a lot of work on that. He's well, he also mentioned the fact that we have to stop the unfunded mandates upon our local governments, which we hear day in and day out by our mayors and managers. So when we talk about freezing taxes, I think he's also talking about giving those local governments some relief over what we pass, which are well-intentioned, but unfortunately cost a lot of money. We're going to hear a lot of things in the next few days, I'm sure, about how this governor plans to craft uh, next year's budget. Uh, how are you going to fix the current problem, the current holes in, in the budget we're living under right now? Well, I think we take one issue at a time, and I think that our members and all the members of the legislature need to address and be, just look at the issue at hand. We are working, our four caucuses are working collectively on trying to address that. I think that we'll see some action within the next few weeks on solving that gap. Well, two weeks from today, we'll be back here with Illinois Lawmakers' live coverage of the governor's budget address. We hope to hear from you then about what he has to say. Thank you. Leader uh, Durkin, Leader Madonia, thank you very much for your time here on thank Illinois you. Lawmakers. Thank you. From all of us at Illinois Lawmakers, so long from Springfield.